Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to be taking a look at probability simulations for all. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Tonight, I'm really excited to be joined by our two panelists, Rachel Gorsuch and Scott Keltner. Rachel is in her 13th year of teaching. She has taught in inner city, rural, and is now at the private school Columbus Academy. Her inspiration comes from when students ask, when are we ever going to use this in real life? Rachel uses technology and mathematical modeling to help her students investigate this question daily. Rachel, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Mike. And Scott teaches mathematics at Eudora High School in Eudora, Kansas. Scott relates to his students through creative, engaging class examples, including dressing like Doc Brown of Back to the Future, Slope R. Mario akin to the Nintendo character, and even a take on Justin Timberlake's 2020 Experience album cover. He uses TI technology to make learning more hands-on, visual, and manipulative to fit the interests of his students. Scott, we're glad to have you with us tonight. Thanks, Michael. I'm excited to be here. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is automatically muted. Feel free at any time to send any questions that you have for Scott or Rachel using the Q&A window on the right side of the screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues, but in the event that you do, try selecting Communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose Audio Broadcast. At this point, Rachel is going to discuss our agenda. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm really excited to be here. I get to combine my love of probability and statistics with my love of sports. So uh, you're going to be hearing a lot about that in our webinar tonight. Uh, you just heard our introductions, but what we're going to be doing next is talking a little bit about what is probability simulation and why should we be doing it. Then we're going to be moving on to doing probabilities of single events, talking a little bit about binomial probabilities, and then Scott's going to take it away with visualizing the normal curve using all of this data. Rachel, thanks so much. And Scott is going to discuss our expected outcomes. In addition to what Rachel was mentioning, we're looking towards uh, exploring theoretical and experimental probability, trying to bridge the two and find a, a fun application or a, a tie-in that relates to some of our students' interests. Uh, we want to demonstrate examples of simulations of probabilities that are difficult for us to compute directly, uh, mostly by letting students have hands-on trials with those. Uh, you'll see shortly that we've got kind of a sports tie-in or a context that should work well to get the students up and moving and be excited about math at the same time. Uh, we want to share activities that engage our students in creating those simulations from those difficult to compute probabilities. Scott, thanks so much. Rachel, you should have control. Feel free to share your screen. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to go ahead and Share my screen. Can you all see my slide okay? Yep, looks good to me, Rachel. Awesome. Then we'll go ahead and get started. Oh, there we go. That's a lot easier to read. And let me pull up the chat because I am a big fan of engaging with everyone who's in the audience. So I just want to encourage you as you go through my time. Hello from New Jersey. As uh, we're going through the time, please join in on the chat. I think it's really valuable to get to know you, and hopefully you'll get to know me as well. So you got to hear a little bit from Scott and a little bit from me. Um, I wanted to share, I'm also from, I, I've taught both middle school and high school. So as I was getting ready for this webinar, I was trying to think about middle school me, and how could I really go back and talk to me in my first year of teaching and convince me 
at that time that I needed to be doing probability because my confession is as a middle school teacher, I taught kids how to do probability, but I didn't let them explore it through simulation. And now that I've been working on this for a lot longer, I have some suggestions for former me. So um, as I reflect on this, I just want to share some of those reflections with you, but also get your participation in the chat so we can learn from each other. And then I'll hand it over to Scott when I'm done, and he's going to talk about some data collection and inference. And I think that's where it just takes it to that next level with our high school students and college students. And I'm really excited to see that flow through all the grades. So some of the questions that guided me as I was coming up with this were the question, what is a probability simulation? And not only that, but why should we be doing it? How is it going to help students gain an intuition about probability? So everything that I put together is really being guided from this. So to start off with, a probability simulation doesn't always have to be technology. It can be any way that we get students to create multiple data sam samples to start to understand a problem a little bit better. We could do it with something like rolling a die or choosing a card, spinning a spinner. But the perks of technology and the reason that I've gravitated towards it is we can do hundreds and thousands of simulations much more quickly. And we know that the more samples we take, the closer we're going to get to the theoretical probability. And it really helps students start to see that when we can build through those things. So there we go. So my part is really for the beginner. What do you do if you've never done probability simulations before? And I think the best piece of advice I have is try to find activities that are already made for you and adapt them because you know your students better than anybody else does. Where I tend to go for activities is I like to go to the Math Inspired website and see what they have and then see how I can make it more meaningful for my students. So that's what I did. I went to the TI Math Inspired website and I found the activity for middle school called one and one equals win. And I know that Mike is awesome. Oh, he is already posting it over in the chat. You're awesome, Mike. Um, he has all of these files ready for you at the end of the session. So at the very end, if you're interested in seeing this for yourself, feel free to download it. Now, in just a moment, we're going to get into the exploration of this task, but I want to remind all teachers, and I know that if you're in on this webinar, you're one of those teachers that you love what you do, and you're working to get better, and you're taking time on a night off to be here, and I appreciate it because it shows that you want to make your pedagogy just better and better. And so I want to remind us that for a task to be good, not just like good, but great. It really depends on the interaction between the teacher and our students. It would be really easy for us to just give this activity to kids and let them push buttons, and it would lose a lot of its power. So our job as a teacher is to be pushing students to making connections, explore what they're seeing, and really think about what they're thinking. They should be able to justify what they're doing. And our job is to keep them engaged with the technology, with the questions, and with each other. So without further ado, I want to show you a little bit about one and one equals win and how it can help teach probability simulations. So I'm going to pull out my TI software. First things first, it poses a question. And I think that that's always a fun way to start a class. Instead of giving a kid a problem, give them something more open-ended, something that they can explore. And this initial question is, can a 60% free throw shooter win the game? If you ask this, of course, you're going to have a ton of kids start jumping in, and they're going to give their own personal bias, right? 
they're going to say, oh, yeah, of course they can, because in in the clutch, they're going to come through, and, and they'll get all passionate about it, and that's awesome. We love when kids are passionate talking about something in math class. But then you ask them to back it up. And here's where the mathematical engagement comes from. You say, how could you prove to me that they could win the game? And maybe they go off and do some research like Scott's going to do. Or maybe you take them down to the gym and you give them the opportunity to start shooting free throws. Another way to do it is with technology. And I actually, I love to take my kids down to the gym first and then have them figure out what percentage of a free throw shooter they are. They have to determine how much their their sample size is going to be and how many trials they're gonna have. And um, all of these things are really important because they're learning the math vocabulary, but they're also just taking some time to play and burn off energy and think about math at the same time, which means they're gonna see math in their own life and they won't be able to unsee it. It's awesome. So anyway, let's look at this for a little bit. Like I said, spinners are a great way to get kids thinking about probabilities. Oh, there's a missed shot right there. There's another missed shot, another missed shot. Oh, we finally made it. Okay. So we have um, spinners to help us start thinking about probabilities. But what I want to ask you in my wonderful chat window over here I want you to come up with a couple questions for me that you could ask about this spinner. So put yourself in the shoes of your, or in your kid's shoes. They see this spinner. They know we're talking about free throws and winning a game. What kind of questions do you think that they would ask about this? So this is the part where I pause for just a minute and I stop talking because I'm really interested in what you have to say. So I'm going to be quiet for about 45 seconds as I give you a chance to type. And then in 45 seconds, I'll go ahead and respond. I look forward to seeing what you say. Yeah, I'm loving these questions. Nice. See, I love taking a little more time to read the chat because I get more and more awesome questions. Oh, I always put a timer on. That was my 45 second timer. I put a timer on not because I want people to hurry up in the chat, but I put a timer on so that I would have to be quiet. And I think that's one of the most powerful things we can do as teachers is force ourselves to be quiet. So what I noticed is a lot of great questions. Like, could you get 10 blue results in a row? That right there is a probability simulation we can do right now. So from Chuck, Chuck, let's see. One, nope, nope, nope. There's one, okay, one, two. Well, not in that simulation. So kids will start to ask, well, how many times am I gonna have to do this to get 10 blue results in a row? And that's a simulation right there. Each time they try for it, they're running another simulation. Why is the red bigger? What a great question. So Nicholas, you'll also notice, I hope, that up here at the top, we can actually start to change this. And what are these numbers representing up here at the top? I'll give you a second to go ahead and, and respond to that question. What is this P equals representing at the top? Chuck says it's area. 
So it's a nice area model for what? The probability of success, the probability of making a shot. Exactly right. So getting students to talk with this vocabulary, the probability of success is the probability he makes it. Well, then what would the other one be? Again, giving you a second to type. If red is the probability of success, in other words, making it, blue would be the probability you missed. That's right, Natalie. So getting this idea of probability of success and probability of failure down, we're getting kids to start thinking about binomial probabilities, which is so great. I mean, think about it. This is something that we want them to get to, and they're already thinking about these things because we're pushing for that vocabulary. We are supporting them as they're doing the simulation. And they can go ahead and check out all of these different things. Now, I did see a question somewhere that said, how did I determine that P equals 0.6? Uh, and that was based on the first slide right here. Can a 60% free throw shooter win a basketball game? So what we're trying to do is explore it with an area model. We're teaching areas um, in middle school anyway, so it makes sense to support it in this way. And then we even have this really cool graphic to take it a next step. We've played around a little bit with the simulation using a spinner trying to figure it out. We've brought in some vocabulary of probability of success versus probability of failure. And now we actually get to simulate a game. So notice we are bringing in the vocabulary trials, losses, ties, wins. So if we click this arrow right here, we had our first shot, he made it. Second shot, he made it. And the game is won. But that would be boring if we only ran one simulation. Also, there's my percentage at 60. I really want to put that at, or it was at 50, and our problem was 60. We could change that percentage to any percentage that the kids were shooting in the gym. We could see if they had the power to, to make the shot. Now, the thing about this right now is the math is a little bit hidden. But that's part of the discussion. We can talk to the kids about what do you think is happening in the background? What do you think they're trying to show with this picture? And how does it relate back to the spinner over here? So all of these things are part of the conversation we have with our kids. We can also go ahead and reset it. There we go. Missed the first shot. Mm, one loss on that trial. We can go ahead and do another one. And we can just let kids play. But remember, we don't want them to play aimlessly. We don't want them to sit there play with the button. We want to ask them, what do you think is actually happening here? And when we do three trials, oh my gosh, three shots missed all in a row. Finally, there we go. The game is won finally out of four trials, but we're keeping this tally here. Oh, nice. I'm back on the trial here. I, I was done uh, playing for a second. Where was Brianna's question? I missed that right there. I'll try to find it again. You know, Natalie, actually, that's a great idea, and you're anticipating where we're going to go with this. Um, the current NBA player instead of having them go down to the gym and find out their own free throw shooting, uh, they could pick an NBA player. And that's actually something more related to what Scott's going to be talking about. So I love that you're already anticipating where this could go. That's awesome. So the idea of this is well, they're running a simulation. They're seeing it. They're able to adapt it to themselves. Um, and it's getting them to think about multiple trials and seeing results over many trials instead of just one or two. And really what we're trying to get them to is this idea of if you take a lot of trials, it's eventually going to get closer to what would happen theoretically as well. Now, like I said before, one of the things that's really interesting about this is you could talk about binomial probabilities as well. but one of the important things about binomial probabilities is when we're going to do a distribution of these, we have to have a set number of trials before we go in. 
which I think is always fun to talk to uh, middle schoolers about because they're like, no, I just want to keep doing it. I want to go until I get the streak that I wanted. That's what I'm looking for. So talking to them about building a good statistical experiment is also really important. Well, I realize I've been talking for a little bit, and I just wanted to um, point out a couple more things, and I'm going to hand it over to Scott. But again, my part of, of this was I wanted to make sure that I showed you a resource that's already made that will connect with your kids, and it will give them the opportunity to do some probability simulation in, I think, a pretty um, easy to engage way. But it also gives you, the teacher, the chance to engage with them, get them out of the classroom, to get them exploring a little bit. And it also gives you the chance to start talking about the statistical language that's so important for teaching probabilities at, at the higher level, too. There is a student worksheet that goes through it. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I thought I had that one pulled up. I'll have to find it again. I am on the web page, though. I think it's really interesting because probability, because it has permeated all of the way through, and it's not just for stats class anymore, and it's not the last chapter in every Algebra 1 book anymore, um, you'll notice that they have this activity for the middle grades math. They also have it slightly adapted to geometry. And again, that idea is experimental versus probability and um, using area models to support it. But they even have it all the way up into calculus and talking about random events and equally likely. And it's the exact same simulation. But that just shows that you can do a lot with a good simulation and you can start to explore it and go deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, if you're willing to engage your students. So, the only thing I kind of wanted to share at this moment, sorry about that, is there is, if, if you are a beginner, and that's, again, who I'm trying to talk to right now, um, you'll notice that I have this link here. TI has this web page that's called Building Concepts. And they actually have videos on here, some student activities, different teacher notes, and different TI-inspired activities. If you want to get into doing probability simulations and you're just not sure, um, this is a way that they can do it. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Scott. And by the way, Scott, I really appreciate um, that you have been over here helping me with the chat. I think that that's awesome. So I'm going to pass this over to Scott. Scott, I think it should be yours now. All right, there, I just had to find one more button. Um, I forget who it was in the chat window over there that showed uh, what about a, a current NBA player as far as trying to find some of their data. And that's the direction that I was heading. I've got a student that's a, I don't, I can, brag pretty good and say that he's a close personal friend of Steph Curry, but he got invited to his camp. And now uh, this is my student over here on the far right, the tall, lanky kid. Um, he's at Creighton University now doing big things. Um, I told him they should start showing video of this webinar at practice tonight, but I don't know if Coach is going to listen to something like that. It doesn't hurt to put in a plug. Uh, where I was trying to turn the corner from where Rachel was is trying to show the the binomial probability as far as what it looks like on the TI-84 and just seeing what those probabilities look like under repeated circumstances. I took it to the, the stat table over here and tried constructing something, but I wanted to show mainly using the quotation marks here so that there's no refresh button on a TI-84. So if I change a value of N or P, similar to what she was doing on the Inspire, I just wanted the TI-84 people to be able to live that life even just briefly to see how this is going to look uh, as far as getting those statistics to update and uh, become as close to real time as I could. So here's one shot of that, and actually I'm going to hit enter and jump back to a main screen. 
And I think that's one warning that I was hoping would pop up because my students get frustrated when they see a domain error like this. If I had a probability stored as P and that happens to be a, a decimal or a number that's stowed on my calculator with this popular stow button that I try and use right above the, the power key. If it happens to be something that doesn't make sense for a probability, that's the error that I'm running into. So I'm hopeful that I can just quit that and get back to it. Because here, if I press alpha and then P, that was my issue. I can't have a probability that somebody's going to make uh, a basket of 5,000, that'd be, what, 500,000 percent. It's all sorts of crazy. So what I needed to do was to store that as some more attainable probability. If I take 0 0.2 and store that as a probability that somebody uses, actually, I'm going to go with Rachel's example and use the 60% shooter. If I store that in there as P, the other part that I noticed is that N up above was stored as 1. So just somebody shooting one free throw trial is what I was trying to simulate with that. Now, if I go back to the stat editor, back in this table right here, I wanted to point out the padlock that's shown up above here. And that's part of the, the fluidity that goes along with this is being able to compute those binomials based upon whatever new value of n or p I had inserted. When I put these quotation marks around the script that I had, the quotation mark is above the addition symbol. So trying to do that allows the data to update along with whatever I'm providing it. It's kind of unique. Now, if I need to edit that for whatever reason, I just have to press enter one time for this script at the bottom of the, the text box to become live again. If I'm satisfied with that or if I need to change what values I'm referring to, they're L1. I was just referring to the number of successes over here in L1 instead of having to type those in individually. So I was trying to attempt a group setup of this. Really trying to lead into the video clip that I've got geared up uh, here in a moment. There, my probability of making zero shots is 40%. Well, if it's 60% likely that I make the shot, then it's 40% likely that I missed it or that I made zero of them out of one attempt. That's what was happening right there. So hopefully they get the, a little respect for uh, complementary probabilities as well. Going beyond that, though, if I started attempting more and more trials, like if I just shot 10 free throws, take 10 and store that as n, the quirky part of this that I wanted to emphasize is if you store n as 10 right here on this screen, when I go back to the stat editor, it populates those values for me, mainly because of what I had done beforehand with the quotation marks. I was trying to see the chat window there. Fell behind here. A memory error. Oops, y'all are still talking about the, the prob sim over there on the chat window. My fault. I'll mind my own business here. Um, getting back to this one though, on the TI-84, I should be able to scroll back through the probabilities that I had and see what those extend to as far as making all 10 shots out of 10 attempts, um, making 9 shots out of 10 attempts, making 8 shots out of 10 attempts. And you see that the most likely outcome there, or the highest probability, is that they make 6 out of 10, which seems to be, according to statistics, you're supposed to make 60% of them. So it makes sense that that has, has the highest probability or the highest likelihood of any of the different outcomes that we could have had from there. That was something I wanted to illustrate as far as the, the TI-84 was concerned. Um, getting a histogram out of it was something else that I could go into. I might wait towards the end and see if we had some uh, comments over there on the chat window as to whether that's something I need to back up and see or not. The reason I was trying to build up all this, and I might foreshadow just a little, back, little bit back here at this screen, game seven of the Western Conference Finals was the Houston Rockets versus the Golden State Warriors. Oops, I need to store that as P. And the Rockets hit a cold spell, a like really, really Arctic cold, um, missing 27 three-pointers consecutively throughout the course of the game until late in the fourth quarter when they started hitting again. And the example that I was trying to allude to here as far as the Inspire activity, I'm trying to show at least an introduction on the TI-84 so that I can make a segue and do the activity on the, uh, the Inspire as well. But I did have a video clip that I was going to show here. If I can briefly pull that one up. It might get kind of glitchy just because of the bandwidth. 
that I'm trying to soak up, I may show about 15 to 20 seconds just to get the idea of what's going along and then uh, jump back into what the actual Inspire activity was doing. And I won't really mess with your volume on this one. One thing that I was trying to show with all of that is, if I skip back around, let me jump to later in the game. Notice as they miss more and more shots consecutively, I have the corresponding probability of missing that many shots in a row, given their prior uh, game footage, that they make 36.2% of their three-pointers for the rest of the season, and then hit this terrible drought um, at the, the most inopportune time of their season uh, in game seven of a conference championship. There, I changed it up, and then as I got deeper and deeper into the game, there's 17 consecutive missed shots. Would be a good time for your students to see how scientific notation is output uh, on your particular handheld, and how that goes along with the context of how unlikely this sort of a drought would be for the the rockets themselves. And there, I got back to it. They're 23 in a row. Oosh. They really, really hit a cold spell. Now the video that I'm showing right here, I have uploaded to a playlist on YouTube. And I've got this one here that shows the probabilities down at the very bottom of the screen. If you wanted to show that to your students, as kind of a capper on a lesson like this. If you would like to just show it as an introductory thing, where the students kind of feed the lesson themselves and say, gosh, it doesn't seem like they should be missing that many, or at some point or another, they have to make one. It seems like that's a question that my students would, would bring up. They've got to be hidden if they're shooting this often. They've eventually got to make one. Um, if that conversation starts up, it may come from an example video that does not have the probabilities listed down at the very bottom, just for the sake of showing how many they missed in a row to feed the need to know about problem, or excuse me, binomial probabilities. So I might jump over here to the Inspire activity. I had started up something over here showing the binomial distributions, the syntax that goes along with it, setting up a sequence of values for the possible number of successful outcomes, and then the binomial uh, probability distribution function with, excuse me, uh, the number of trials, the probability of success on any given trial, and then the number of successes referring back to the list of successes that we had over here. Hopefully you're seeing how similar this looks to the L1 and L2 makeup that I had on the TI-84. As I tried a couple more examples with it, the same sliders that we had seen with Rachel's activity, changing up the number of trials and the probability of success. The part that I really, really liked about these is I could customize it exactly the way that the rockets were seeing things that if they did 36.2% of their field goal or three-point shots over a season, if they wanted to shoot here, I could set up 27 consecutively, seeing that it seems as though they should make between well, that's between 9 and 12 um, makes out of that one. Sorry, 9 points. Uh, 774 is what they should have made out of that, if I can get that without my scratch pad going on here. But just seeing how that example leads into the conversation of, gosh, they just got to be hitting one of these at some point or another. So I wanted to emphasize the woes that the Rockets were going through and give a couple of key factors to go along with that and use the binome PDF function as far as the Inspire was concerned. And see how that worked here using the example that I had shown here, showing the syntax that goes along with it so that students can see how many trials with the one represented right there and then zero successful outcomes at the very end. I put in this calculator page with the idea in mind that they would be able to scroll back through their history, which I think is a really, really convenient thing to do with repeated trials. And they could do this on the fly as they're watching the video in class too, was my intention of making the video and showing this one as well. If I wanted to change the number of trials, I'm just going to change that to two shots. What's the likelihood of taking two shots and making zero of them and extending that one? If I extended the same thing, 
I can eventually skip this up to well, what's the chances that you missed, excuse me, shot 21 and made zero of them. And I could even get into just how specific the Inspire gets with those. I arrowed back up to the previous answer and can see what that was alluding to and see that, well, it's not just four zeros and an eight, that there was some rounding error that goes along with that, that the uh, precision is something that's necessary for us to talk about. That was one example that I was trying to get to there. I already bragged about my student having a little bit of elbow time with uh, Steph Curry, but getting into the activity that I was striving for there was the other one, oops, excuse me, there's the one I needed. Was the normal bar graph activity. I'm not gonna lie, I had to find a cheesy way to work an acronym into education, because so many of us have to deal with that on the regular. Um, I had to come up with normal bar graph activity. It's not completely mathematically, mathematically accurate, but one thing that I wanted to do uh, with this was show how a normal distribution applies whenever a player gets more and more games played in their career. So I chose Steph Curry because I tend to show a little favoritism to him. On the pages that followed after this, I wanted you to be able to see that Steph Curry uh, through his rookie year and his first several seasons, as he accumulated more and more games played, the graph of his points per game, uh, if I could find those statistics, and I, I did include uh, all the data that goes along with this in the cell right here off to the side. Whenever I have uh, data that I don't necessarily want students to have access or editing capabilities of, I sometimes will make it into an Inspire slide and just slide it off to the side, because in that case, they have to have the teacher software in order to make further edits. I can show an example of that. There's the program that I had, and that's not really something that I want the students to have access to. Um, not long ago, I did an example with body weight and backpack weight in class, and I didn't want students to make fun of one another or those students that are sensitive about their weight to be insulted by an activity like that. So trying to take their data input it on the Inspire, and then shove it off to the side like this. They weren't able to see that the third kid who got weighed is the third one on my cell, and then go after that person for whatever reason. Um, made, made students participate a lot more likely in this example, and uh, made it from a better conversation in class as well. The other examples that I had here, using the law of large numbers, as anything gets more and more sample size, we notice that it's going to tend to look like a normal distribution. And that was exactly what I was trying to show here as Steph Curry accumulated more and more years' experience uh, in the NBA. So on the page here, it took a lot of coding for me to be able to do this and overlay a bell curve or a normal probability plot on top of his actual raw data. So there's Steph Curry during his rookie year, tended to favor that 15, sorry, 14 to uh, and 15 point range during that rookie year. But using the pointer arrows that I had up here, I could go and accumulate that through not only his rookie season, but also his second season, and then into 2012, again, accumulating data, noticing that the more and more games he plays, and that I am able to tabulate his statistics on, let's see, the more normal his graph becomes. Even up here through the 2016 season, which ended up pretty darn good for them, the 2017 season, where they got another ring, and the 2018 season. So the part that I, I usually regularly laugh at uh, with, these, with the data that they had as far as the, the Golden State Warriors was concerned, I got kind of a grin on my face when I looked at their tagline on their shirts throughout the playoffs, seeing that they had strength in numbers, knowing that I was going to build up a lesson like this in the near future. So that really helped my case to have that, that pun in my pocket, because I'm always looking for the next great dad joke that I can throw at my students. The shape that it resembled was the one I was trying to allude to here, is I wanted students to discover, just by investigation here, that it really, really closely resembles a bell curve. Uh, in all fairness, I had done this to compare LeBron James against Steph Curry, against Michael Jordan, against Kobe Bryant, and then I also included Kevin Durant in the argument because I had so many students that were just interested in their favorite NBA player and what their statistics look like. Um, 
if anybody else wants to put it to the test, Kobe Bryant's data, because he had so many years' experience in the league, was a really, really precise fit to a normal probability plot. Um, so I, I could extend that one. If you want to hit me up on Twitter, I think Michael included that in our introductory slide or our biography slide. Let me know, and I'll, I'll feed some data back to you because I just focused tonight on Steph Curry's data. The examples I was trying to go to here was just showing the nine years that he's been in the league, and I had to capitalize league because I figured it was worth it, the 721 games that he had played, and then obviously his points per game average there. Again, off to the right, you can see here I'm using the teacher software, and that's the only chance that I have to edit and pull those um, the spreadsheet and uh, statistics pages out if I wanted to do that. Here the normal probability plot, just looking at the, the graphs and data that goes along with it. I set up a density plot rather than a frequency plot just because I figured it was easier to, to tie in a standard deviation uh, with it as a decimal as a percentage rather than the frequency of games because it would constantly be scaling that thing over and over again as far as the Inspire trying to reconfigure or render the data that goes with it. The game points that I used there, the game points just for Steph Curry was his entire career accumulation through the end of this 2017-2018 season. If I wanted to look at any given single season, that's what I tried to give access to. As if students remember that during 2016, well, they thought that that might have been a down year, but they remembered the one time that he went for 54 points in a game and seeing that that may constitute an outlier as far as the rest of this is concerned. I set up a couple other points there where we can just look at the playoff points that he had done and see that, well, playoffs, he tends to go off once in a while, but not a significant amount of time. And playoffs is not a huge sample size. It's a very, very specific, precise subset of our data. But I might leave that one back here with the game points for Steph and go back to that one. I had to use Golden State Warriors colors, too, or else I was going to get made fun of in class. I think if you've got questions that are popping up for me or if I'm, I'm needing to emphasize other contexts of this, please let me know in the chat window. I'm trying to take a peek at it here once in a while. The other part that I wanted to get to, and this is sort of a modified play on an activity that I found on the, the activities exchange on the TI website that Rachel had mentioned earlier, is looking at some of the characteristics of what constitutes something being a normally distributed variable and seeing how those look. That the graph does tend to be uh, mound-shaped or bell-shaped, being centered about the mean, being a continuously measured variable. Now with my points per game average, there's no chance that in a certain game that Steph Curry is going to pop off for 34.1 points in a game. But the data that I had, the raw data, could go along with that as well. Um, it's it's kind of weird when students make that prediction that Steph is going for uh, 24.39 points per game on average. Well, there's no chance that he's going to score 0.39 of a point in a given game. But it gives us at least a baseline where we might expect to make some estimations. The inflection points was a critical point that I got to uh, with my students and understanding how that extends into the empirical rule, which is another portion that I got to later on with this activity. Down there. Whenever I had a graph that was centered about the mean, And got back into one of these also, where similar to Rachel's example, you're able to modify by using a slider. And students could see that that normal curve shape tends to exist when you apply a couple of transformations to it. Whether you move it to the left, to the right, when you apply a larger or a smaller standard deviation, what exactly that means as far as the spread of our data. Let's see. Um, James. I think was the one looking for the binomial PDF on the TI-84. Let me jump over to my TI-84 software real quick because I had that same issue earlier this afternoon. It's actually under the Dister menu for distributions. I tried second and then right there. It's quite a ways down through this list here. Just barely off screen was the binomial PDF right there. Um, I always have students that run into issues on their TI-84, especially the plus CE. And if they need a hint or a shove in the right direction as far as um, 
trying to see what syntax or what notation needs to follow after that, hitting the addition symbol after that gives them a heck of a shove in the right direction. I think, who's the one asking about LeBron? Linda, I'm sorry. I've got LeBron data. I just figured for the sake of time I was able to focus on one of them. Uh, the student that I had in class was not best friends with Steph Curry, but that tended to be where my allegiance lies. And plus, I, I mentioned the strength in numbers tagline that Golden State was using this past season. That seemed like the best dad joke that I can use in a math classroom. Um, sorry, I do have LeBron data out there. I just didn't share it for tonight. James, I'm glad that worked out for you. And then the, the paste options there were kind of interesting as far as my students trying to get to those as well. Just seeing that at the bottom of the screen, they could tie those in as well. So I need to escape that one and get back to it. Glad that worked out for you. If I can get back to my Inspire, seeing what those look like. I did set this up so that the standard deviation was going to be non-negative. It seems like a decent context for my students. I wanted them to see an example of a small standard deviation that tends to cluster the data really, really closely together, and you don't see a whole lot of variation with that. That would be the same as, well, Steph Curry, or let me go with LeBron. If LeBron can punch the clock every night and just hit his standard 24 points, that would be the measure that you might see here, where there's a big mound in the graph right at 24 points, or wherever I was able to slide that around here. I have that part there, getting into the idea that anything that resembles a normal distribution can be represented with a, a bell curve. This is where we get into the standard normal distribution. Assigning Z scores and things of that nature was a decent conversation for us to be able to have in class. And referring everything thing, excuse me, to its uh, corresponding standard deviation. And the example that I used there, just to give some language that students might use, what's the probability that Steph explodes for more than 40 points? on a given night, or that LeBron blows up for 48 or 60 points in a given night. And I'm really hoping to see some big things from him on the Lakers this year. No offense to his contributions to the Cavs, but I'm, I'm kind of ex excited to see what uh, Papa Ball is going to do as far as all that's going. The normal curve here, I wanted to allude to the empirical rule, and then kind of conclude there just by emphasizing this is an activity that I had modified myself from the the TI Activities Exchange website. So there was that one. If I can get into the chat menu, I should be able to get to. I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Michael here. If there's any other questions that I can answer, please hit me up over here in the chat messages. But I think, oh, I did have one other context. I mentioned this one. I needed to get back to my desktop because I did have, my students will ask me, and my wife gets so irked at this example, but I have been the guy that wears the same shirt on my staff ID badge every year. So when my students ask what does a, a standard deviation of zero look like, my ID badges represents a standard deviation of almost zero, except for that one year that my wife decided she was going to hide my shirt from me or she was going to say that the people I work with think she can't do laundry. So there was my visual example of a standard deviation of almost zero. Myra, I feel your pain. I've got the Inspire in my classroom. Um, it's it's a growing process for sure. Um, stick it, hang in there. It gets better. Um, finding applications or different activities like the ones that we've shown tonight are pretty Pretty good examples of just how ready-made some of these activities can be and how your, your co-workers co excuse me, um, can hit the ground running and implement those activities as quick as possible. Um, it's a lot cheaper than teachers pay teachers as well. I got to put that plug in there. But there are tons of ready-made examples out there. Uh, I found several different places where we can get some grant funding as far as trying to purchase another classroom set. Actually, I received a classroom set of 16 through donor's shoes in the mail today. So I'm, I'm kind of a testament to it's possible to get these things in the hands of your students. It's a great experience for them. It uh, pays dividends for them to get to, to see the rich context where you can apply and manipulate the math on the fly. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Michael. Michael, if I can just take a, 
the the reins for just a second. I did want to finish up the webinar with a challenge for everybody, um, like a pedagogical. That's awesome. Thank you. So what I'm going to do, going to. So our challenge, as Scott and I were working on this, is we want to challenge you to use probability simulation sometime in your classroom this year. And maybe it'll be this week or this month or this school year, but we're hoping that you really take something away from this activity and bring it and adapt it for your classroom. Uh, we are big fans of Twitter and we like talking about sports and statistics and probability on Twitter as well. So if you use the hashtag T3Learns, we'd love to have you tag us. You'll see that I'm Rachel H. Gorsuch and then we have Scott Keltner. And like we said, we, we really enjoyed hanging out with you guys tonight and sharing a little bit about our passion for basketball and sharing a little bit about our passion for, uh, for probability. And, and we want to hear from you. It, it's been too good of a night to not have it continue. And now I'll hand it back over to Mike. Rachel, thanks so much. As we begin to wrap things up tonight, if you do have any last minute questions uh, for Scott or Rachel, please feel free to get those asked. I know they'll do their best to get those last minute questions answered. Uh, so earlier, Rachel shared a few things from Math Inspired. Um, I just want to go directly to uh, one thing she mentioned directly was uh, building concepts. So if you visit our website and under activities, um, you can go and check out the Math Inspired on the left hand side. Uh, there's some really great things under there. Um, Scott was sharing some things from Math Inspired as well as from 84 Activity Central for um, the TI-84 Plus series. Um, specifically, I want to call out the building concepts in mathematics. And I think what Rachel was alluding to earlier was the specific tag to statistics and probability. That's right. So if you kind of take a look through some of these. Um, you can kind of see the grade level that they're geared towards, and I think as Rachel mentioned, um, probability and statistics is one of those things that uh, if you rewind 10, 15 plus years ago, um, there was probably a course that students had to take in order to really experience a lot of the, the probability and statistics. You didn't find a lot of students in Algebra one or middle grades um, engaging in a lot of that, but um, things are changing, and, uh, and so we're, uh, we're trying to make sure that we're helping meet the needs of those students. Um, I think the things that I love about these, um, and there's a lot of them, is even though uh, they might be tagged as a grade six or grade seven uh, level, um, I personally teach high school, and I bet that a lot of my high school students could benefit from some of the visuals uh, and some of the takeaways from some of these uh, activities. Again, each of these individually have their own uh, TI Inspire file as well as, well as uh, student notes and uh, teacher notes as well. So please feel free to visit our website and take a look at some of those building concepts files. We're really excited to be bringing the T-Cube International Conference to Baltimore this coming year uh, in early March. Um, I know I'm gonna be there. I'm pretty sure if I had to guess, both Scott and Rachel will be there. So it's a great opportunity to uh, meet Scott and Rachel and um, probably attend some sessions that they're going to be presenting. Uh, it's, it's personally for me uh, just one of the best professional development opportunities that I've, I get to experience every year. Uh, not only do I get to meet people like Scott and Rachel, but um, I get to share uh, my experiences and my thoughts with other like-minded people, uh, and that's pretty invaluable to me. And it's nice to be able to walk away from that uh, and still have these contacts. And I can email Scott or email Rachel uh, for ideas and questions. So um, please feel free to uh, learn a little bit more and visit our website. Uh, you can find more information about the International Conference. Uh, currently there is a, a re discount for registration, which I believe uh, runs to the end of October. When you leave the webinar tonight, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events, and we really hope you share your thoughts. To 
receive a certificate of attendance. Go ahead and click the link. Nope, incorrect link. Try this one more time. There we go, click the link in the chat window. Uh, there's actually two links there. One link is for the certificate of attendance and the other link is for the documents that were used tonight by Scott and Rachel. Um, if for some reason those links aren't working for you or uh, you can't access them tonight, um, don't worry, you'll automatically get a follow-up email in a couple of days and in that follow-up email will be a link to the recording as well as a link to the certificate and link to the documents. If you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. After the webinar tonight, if you're need, uh, in the need of any post-webinar follow-up, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-TI-CARES or drop us an email at ti-cares at ti.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much, Rachel and Scott, for uh, engaging us in some probability simulations tonight. I know I had a lot of fun. Um, I can't wait to try some of this with my students, and uh, I hope everyone uh, agrees with me that uh, things were great tonight. So thanks so much, uh, Rachel and Scott, for all your time. Thanks, Mike. It was fun being here. Absolutely. It makes me look forward to basketball season now. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and we hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night.